Uh, so this, the question we're going to ask here tonight is this question, um, why, God, do you allow pain and suffering? And so this is actually a really important question. Now it's probably too loud, right? Okay. Um, in fact, uh, George Barna, who's like a, a pollster, you know, put, takes a public uh, opinion pollster, asked this question in a national survey. If you could ask God any question, what would you ask him? And the number one question was, God, why do you allow pain and suffering, right? And one, one uh, writer has called this question kind of like a, a question mark shaped in, as a fish hook that's sort of tugging at the human heart, right? It's just one of these that we all sort of deal with, and, and, and it... it, it we uh, feel it at the level of our lives, right? And I know in this room, all of us have experienced angst, and, you know, heart, sort of low-level suffering all the way to some pretty horrific things. And so um, you, you might not know the name Kevin Carter, uh, but you do know the picture uh, that uh, Ke- I just took it off my slide, uh, but you, you, you know the picture if I'm going to tell you about it. It's a picture, 1994, I think 93, 94, forget the exact uh, day, but it was the, the picture of the vulture in the background with the starving child that's cut, basically trying to make her way to a feeding station. Do you guys remember this picture? Uh, Pulitzer Prize winning picture, actually. And it's horrific. It's a horrific picture. And so Kevin Carter is the guy who took that picture in 1993-94. He won the Pulitzer Prize because of that. So it gets to the, the pinnacle of, of his uh, career, and six months later he commits suicide. And in that, he leaves a note, and in that suicide note, he says, the pain of life is, is too much to handle, and, and he just gave up. And so that's what we're going to talk about, and I talk about this all the time at, at the seminary, and um, because it's such a heavy topic, though, I like to, what I call, stretch our legs, and so I kind of warm up into this topic, and so I want to stretch our legs here tonight, if we can, because we're going to m- make our way toward, toward a pretty heavy topic, but I want to give, I want to frame it again, and so I'll, I'll, I call it, we're stretching our legs, and so let me begin by uh, asking a series of warm-up questions, and so this will be for you guys, a little interaction here, if we can. Um, whoa, where'd you go? Where'd you all go? Okay. Um, Okay, first question. According to culture, so just think man or woman on the street, if you walked up to them and asked, what is the good life, what are some of the answers you think we would get? What would you hear? What's that? Comfort, Comfort. Yeah. okay. Yeah. Money, lots of money, of course, Security. yep. Security, okay. Eat, drink, and be merry. Eat, drink, and be merry, absolutely. Pleasure, comfort, yeah. money, health. and health. Yeah, we all want that. It'd be power, yes, yeah, we all have our little power struggles, politicians, they really want it. Okay, good, so fame and fortune, comfort, security, things like that. Okay, um, they, and to summarize that, they just want to be what? What's the word? Happy, right? We just want to be happy. Okay, so next question. How do you think, given what we just said, what do you think people mean when they say, I want to be happy? What is happiness for the man or woman on the streets today? Okay, security, getting what we want, feel good. Yeah, perfect, good. Exactly, yeah. So pleasure, feeling good, and the, which is, if this is what happiness is, what does pain become? Well, that becomes man's greatest problem because it keeps us from happiness, right? So we'll come back to that. So, okay, so today they think happiness is, is something like, actually it would be something like usually sensual pleasure, or um, some sort of self-satisfaction of, you know, whatever it is that we're after. That's, that's kind of how happiness is, is defined today. Here's the next question then. Okay, on this view of happiness, is anyone really happy? If it's just sensual pleasure and self-satisfaction, is anyone, can anyone really be happy? No, 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 not all the time. In fact, there's this kind of comical... Uh, um, seen in, in a, so our very first historian is a guy named Herodotus, and he wrote this book called The Histories, and uh, this was way back, like, you know, ancient Greece kind of thing, and in there, there's, there's this kind of comical story, though. Um, the very first guy to coin uh, gold coins in the ancient world was a guy named Croatius. Has anybody heard of Croatius? Um, he's kind of made his way into Aesop's fables and, and things like this, this story, but uh, anyway, he was a very rich king in Persia, which is like sort of modern-day Turkey today. And um, this, this guy from Greece named Solon, who was a wise man from Solon, is reported, 
in this story, to have come to Croatius, uh, uh, to come to Persia and, and visit with the king Croatius. And Croatius, of course, you know, wealthy king, gold coins with his image on the face. And so Croatius wants to ask Solon this very important question. And so he asks him, at least this is as reported by Herodotus, he asks him, who is the happiest person on the face of the earth? Thinking, of course, the answer would be him. Look at all the wealth. Look at everything he has. Solon thinks about it, and he basically names some dead guy. Croatius is furious. Why are you naming some dead guy? He says, okay, fine. Who's the second happiest person in the face of the earth? Thinking, okay, fine, at least I'll be the second. Solon thinks about it a little bit, and he, he names two more dead guys. Croatius is furious. Why do you keep naming dead people? And this is what Solon says. He says, you can never determine when someone is happy until they've died because you don't know how their life will end, right? And we know this too. Life is fickle. Things can happen. And, um, and so we don't know if Croatius is happy. And as it turns out, he actually ended up being a tribute. He, he was subjected to a different kingdom, Egypt, and spent the rest of his life in misery. So he was not happy. Um, so it's kind of an interesting story. We can't be happy if this is what happiness is, what our culture says it is. Here's the question then, so why are we so miserable? Because actually the stats, and you probably know this sort of anecdotally, the stats are that I think it's something like over one in five Americans are on some sort of antidepressant, right? We're, we're just, we're miserable as a culture, um, trying, trying to sort of make our way. And so there's this question, why are, we, why are we so miserable if we all long for happiness? And let me just give you two reasons and we're gonna begin to work our way to why I'm sort of stretching our legs here. Um, the first reason why I think we're all kind of miserable, just sort of thinking about this a little bit, is because we have become pacified, I think, as a, as a culture. And we're pacified in two ways today. I think first way that we're pacified is that we tend to live now, in our day and age, vicariously through others. And what I mean by that is we tend to, at least my generation and the millennial generation, we tend to live through Netflix, you know? We sit there and binge watch and live our life through some other story, or maybe it's sports, in your generation, you know, watching, watching college football all, all weekend long or something like that. But we, we tend to live through, you know, others. And, and that's, of course, fine. We like sports. We like stories. We like movies. Um, but here's the problem. God has created each of us to live a life, right? And in fact, he's created us to live a dramatic life. And as we live vicariously through other things, we, we kind of forget the fact that we've been created to live a dramatic life, and so we become pacified. Okay? First reason why I think we become pacified. Second reason is I think by and large as a culture, we, are, we have become addicted to, and I'm going to borrow from Lewis because, sorry, I just can't help it. Uh, we've become addicted to Turkish delights. Does anybody remember these, these things? From, uh, this is The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. So what is, what is this? Anybody remember? Edmund finds these little candies. So what happened when he ate them? Do you remember? Yeah. He, that's all he wanted. And, and so these are actually little candies. I don't know if you've had them. They're not, to me, that great. But uh, yeah, they're, they're, I don't like them either. But, um, but for Edmund, so he has this Turkish delight, and that's all he wanted. That's all he could think about in the story, if you read The, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. But for Lewis, he, of course, he's very brilliant here. What the Turkish delight represented was something that gives you immediate sensual payoff, but ultimately ends up enslaving you. Okay? So think about that. We as a culture are addicted to Turkish delights. Now, it, it's not these candies. It could be uh, pornography or sports or money or, or accomplishment or, or drugs or alcohol or whatever it could be. Um, these are a kind of Turkish delight, right? Something that gives us immediate sensual payoff but ultimately ends up enslaving you, okay? So, that's, so this is why we're pacified, two reasons. Living vicariously through others, we're addicted to Turkish delights. Second reason why... Um, I think we're kind of miserable though, is, and this is something that Aristotle actually says, is we, we no longer ask preliminary questions. And actually Aristotle, who is a philosopher, he said if we want to live well, we need to ask the right preliminary questions. And here's something about our culture. We no longer know how to ask the right questions. You know, we all want happiness, but has, does it occur to anybody to ask what happiness actually is? Um, and how can you get it? And is God connected to it in any way or, or things like this? We no longer ask these preliminary questions. And so as a result, we're, we're, we're confused, I guess. Okay, next question. We're almost done stretching our legs here. Um, how does all this connect to the problem of pain and suffering? Somebody said it earlier. So think of it this way. If happiness is largely defined in terms of sensual pleasure, 
then pain and suffering are seen in our culture in that day, and in, in this setting, as the greatest hindrance to our happiness, right? Pain and suffering are the greatest hindrance. So on this view, what is our greatest need? It's the elimination of pain and suffering. And the way that we do that is usually through technology. And so we misdiagnose man's fundamental problem. It's not sin, it's pain. And so we misdiagnose the solution. It's no longer Christ, it's usually technology becomes the great savior. Medicine, whatever. There, I mean, we could talk about it. There's so many things there. Okay, that's how this connects. Um, one last thing here. I think it is, maybe it would be helpful before we uh, jump into our topic. What is happiness? <laughs> um, since we all want it. Let me give you the answer, classic, classically. So uh, let's we'll start with Greece and then we'll go to the Hebrews. Um, classically, if you look at ancient Greece, it's always been um, a kind of flourishing. So Plato, Aristotle, Socrates, all these guys, happiness was flourishing in light of our nature. So we're rational animals, so that would mean intellectual and moral virtue, right? So that's the kind of people that we are. It's the kind of nature that we have. Well, that's interesting. That's Socrates, Plato, Aristotle. The Hebrews have a very similar concept. Uh, it's in, in the Bible, it's shalom. Same concept, happiness. Shalom it, it translated sometimes peace, um, but it's actually richer than the absence of strife. What shalom means is flourishing in light of our nature. And so the Hebrews just added God to that picture. And so shalom, flourishing, is intimacy with God, harmony with each other, rightly related with ourself, that's our character, as we live at our end. Okay, so that's shalom. Um, that's what happiness is. And in fact, God, this is one of my favorite passages in the Psalms, is Psalm 35. God wants you to be happy. Now, not in the shallow sense of our culture, but in the rich sense of flourishing. So look at, look at this. this is Psalm 35, verse 27. It says, Great is the Lord who delights in the welfare, the flourishing of his servant. God wants us to be happy. Now, don't hear that as the shallow version of happiness. God wants you to flourish in, in the way that he has created you. Now, all this is actually relevant to framing the, the problem that we're going to talk about here in a second, okay? Um, okay, so last thing, uh, just one of my favorite quotes from Lewis in his book, The Problem of Pain. Just look at this quote. He said, it's not simply that God has arbitrarily made us such that he is our only good. Rather, God is the only good of all creatures. And by necessity, each must find its good in that kind of degree and fruition of God, which is proper to its nature. This is actually, Lewis is a classical scholar. He's basically saying the same thing. Happiness is flourishing in light of our nature. To, and here's the three options. To be God, to be like God, and to share in his goodness, or to be miserable. That's the only options, if you think about it. So you've got three. You can be God, you can be like God, and share in his goodness, or you can be miserable. And obviously we're not God, so we've only got two options. We're either miserable and we eternally starve, or we can share in his goodness in creaturely response. Those are, that's the only happiness that there actually is. That's the only happiness that he gives. Just, I think that's a great way to frame uh, what we're gonna engage in here, so, okay? Are you guys good? Are you feeling stretched? All right, <laughs> sorry, I need feedback, it's just, how it is here. Okay, now let's go theologically. Um, let's move a little deeper here. Okay, theological perspectives on pain and suffering. So first question, and I'll just throw these out to you guys. Can we expect happiness in the sense of this sort of sub shallow, subjective pleasure uh, in life all the time from God? No, right, yeah, no, we, we can't expect that. Nowhere in the Bible does it say we have a right to that kind of happiness, this shallow you know, life is eat, drink, and be merry all the time. I mean, obviously, there is some of that. There is, there is uh, pleasure. I think it, pleasure is actually an intrinsic good, and it's from God. And in fact, we own that. The Christians own pleasure, but it needs to be in its proper context. Um, okay, next question uh, then. How, what, do, what do we have a right to as Christians? And that reminds me mm -hmm. Mm. And I think that's wrong for a thing that's true. 
yeah. But I don't think that's correct. Depending on what, yeah, de- yeah, right. It's because that sounds like happiness is an emotion. That's a very shallow and actually contemporary view, maybe the last 50 years, uh, that that has become the definition. So, yeah, that's good. So what do we have a right to as Christians? Well, you ready? Uh, here we do. We have a right to trials, to temptation, to suffering. And you have a right to strength and peace and comfort and the power and the joy uh, to get through those trials and temptation and suffering. You know, you guys know these passages. For example, 1 Peter 4, 12. Do not, su- do not be surprised as you go through trials um, and so on. So, so, we, so this is what we have. We, life is hard, but we also have uh, access to the throne room of grace and, and things like that. Okay, one last little question here as we jump in. Uh, what are some of God's purposes for suffering? Uh, in scripture, there's a number of purposes that we see. There's this general idea that God's redemptive purpose, which is interesting, is, is accomplished uh, through suffering often. Think about um, Christ on a cross or sac- the sacrificial system in the Old Testament with animals um, and, and things like that. Um, so what are some of his purposes? Well, maturity. Think of James 1, you know, that we, we become mature uh, through persevering in trials and suffering. Uh, it brings glory to God. Uh, sometimes it proves or refines our faith. Um, it brings us closer to God. There's lots of purposes that we can discern. Uh, but we'll come back to that in just a second as well. All right. So this is all stretching. So hopefully now we're going to actually address the main question. So remember, here's the main question. Why, God, do you allow pain and suffering? Now, this is typically under the rubric of something in philosophy uh, called uh, the problem of evil. Has anybody heard this phrase before, the problem of evil? Um, What that is, there's all these problems in philosophy that people have been debating for the last 2,000 years. And we don't, you know, we're we're still debating them today. So there's the mind-body problem. You know, are you just a, a brain, a body, or do you have a mind too? That's one of the problems that they debi- the debate. Well, this is the problem of evil. That's one that we'll talk about today. And so within this, I want to kind of locate wh- what I want to talk about today. Um, the problem of evil is kind of a constellation of problems. And you can see it here. Actually, I'll try to draw it up a little differently. Um, the problem of evil... usually goes like this. There's the intellectual problem of evil, and then there's what's called the emotional problem of evil. And they're slightly different. So the intellectual problem, again, this might be more than you want, but I'm going to just give you the framework. There's the logical and the evidential problem. I'll explain that in a minute. Um, And what this says, so the intellectual problems uh, are are the domain of theology and philosophy. So, you know, we're dealing with a question about Um, On the logical side, there's the claim that the coexistence of God and evil is logically impossible. You know, you have God and you have evil and the two can't go together. But we obviously have evil, so therefore God doesn't exist. Okay, that's the logical problem, um, that belief in God is impossible. I'm not going to deal with that. I'd be happy to talk about it, um, but I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to bore you with all that today. The evidential problem says, hey, Okay, fine, there's no logical contradiction between the existence of God and evil, but look at all this horrific evil. Look at all this pointless evil. Given the amount and the distribution and the intensity of the, point of the evil that we see in this world, God probably doesn't exist. That's what's called the evidential problem. So God, it's improbable that God exists. Okay, so these are the realm of theology and philosophy. The emotional problem is basically, um, how do we deal with pain and suffering in our own lives? And that's the realm of the pastor and the counselor. And and these are very different problems, right? These are about intellectual issues, and it requires kind of an intellectual response. These are more pastoral, and um, it usually requires a listening ear, uh, a hand around the shoulder, you know, praying for them and things like that. Um, what, we're, what the question I'm asking, the way I'm framing it today, why God do you allow pain and suffering is this one right here. So we're going to kind of, I'm going to drill down on this part here because I think this is the one that most often comes up in conversations that I have with people. They're not looking for some logical contradiction and there, there could be emotional stuff too, but we need to learn to hear what people are actually asking so that you can, you know, address the right thing. By the way, um, 
most people probably don't reject God because of the intellectual reason. It's probably over here. Let me put it this way. They don't refute belief in God. They reject God because of something horrific in their life. Think of Charles Darwin. You guys know Darwin? Um, 1859, Origin of Species, Evolution, all that. Do Do you guys know why he was an atheist, though? It wasn't because of evolution. It was because his nine-year-old daughter died. That's why he rejected God. It wasn't evolution or anything like that. It was an emotional uh, rejection of God because of suffering. Okay? So anyway, that's a little framework. We're going to focus on, it's called the evidential, but we're just going to, we're going to ask it as a question. Are you guys okay? Any questions before I jump in a bit? Um, hadn't, haven't given one yet. Um, let's see, I think I have a, there you go. What is evil? Okay, so thank you. Um, that's a good lead. Here's, here's, how, here's how we'll think of evil. Um, evil is an ought not to be. Think of it that way. An evil is an ought not to be. It's just bad stuff. Now there's, Augustine has said it's just the privation of the good and things like that, but, but we can think of it for our purposes as just things that shouldn't be. And I'm going to come back to that too. But that's how I'm thinking of it. One last thing on evil is, uh, is that there's also a good distinction to be made between kinds of evil. So evil is an ought not to be. But there's two different basic kinds out there. There's what's called what we would call moral evil and what we would call natural evil. Moral evil are all the things that are done by cre- free creatures like us that misuse our freedom. So all the bad stuff that we do, the horrific evil that took place on Sunday with the church down in the, uh, near San Antonio was an example of a moral evil, right? It was a misuse, a horrific misuse of creaturely freedom in that case. Natural evils, on the other hand, would be things like tsunamis and tornadoes and disease and, and, and the kinds of suffering that comes up because of the world that we live in. And so... Um, Think of you know, hurricanes and, and tsunamis and things like that. Now, sometimes they're intertwined, by the way. You could have a deforestation you know, happening in Africa because of a corrupt government that withholds funding and aid that's given you know, from another country. And so there you have moral evil that, that interacts closely with natural evil as well. Yeah? Is there a supernatural evil? Uh, uh, you mean like angels and fallen angels, maybe? Yeah, I mean, I, I would put, depending on what you mean by that, I would put that in the moral category. Uh, although, yeah, it, there'd be a little debate. But yeah, I'd put it mostly in, if we're talking about angels and, and the, the fallen angels, it would be a kind of moral evil. At least that's a typical way of thinking of it. Okay. So, what do we do with, you know, why God do you allow pain and suffering? Let me give you the way that this argument looks. Here's an argument. Uh, this is from the atheist to the Christian. Okay? If God exists, there wouldn't be pointless evil. But there probably is, because we see all this evil that has no point. Therefore, God probably doesn't exist. This is why it's called the evidential argument. Um, Now, if you can look at this simple argument here, look at premise one. If God exists, pointless evil does not exist. Do you guys like that? As Christians? Does that seem right? No? I, I like that. If God, if God exists, you know, the, we would hope that there'd be a morally justified reason for all evil, all suffering, all pain, right? So most theists don't have a problem with premise one, I'll just say. Um, where, the pro, where, where we would want to push back is this one, Oops, sorry, ah. um, that there's pointless evil, okay? So, because God is good, so... so now, evil per se, evil in itself is bad. It's always bad. It's not a question of whether evil itself is good or bad. The relevant question is this. Does God have a morally justified reason for allowing evil? Okay, do you hear the distinction? Evil per se is bad. That's not up for debate. The question is, does God have a morally justified reason for allowing evil? That's what's at stake. And that's where the question usually gets rephrased. God, why do you allow evil? What is that reason? Do you hear the, you hear the question? What is the reason why you allow pain and suffering, okay? All right, and I'll just keep going. You can, you can ask questions if this isn't making sense. I'm gonna try to, again, just like last week, try to talk it through as best I can simply and then leave as much time for talk as we can. Now, there's two ways that um, 
Christians typically try to refute that second premise. Remember that second premise is, hey, there's pointless evil. One way is to say, no, it's not pointless. Here's the reason. Let me tell you what that reason is. That's that first one up there, A. The second way is to say, no, there is a reason. We just don't know it. Okay, now those are two different strategies. The first reason, the first way, by providing a reason, is called giving a theodicy. That's the, and I promise you I won't give you too many words, but theodicy comes from two Greek words, theos for God, and then another Greek word, dike, for justice. So God justifying reasons for, for evil. That's what giving a theodicy is, but it's just saying here's the reason. And here's how it goes. Um, you have this whole bag, I call it a theodicy bag, um, of reasons. Well, maybe it's because maybe it's because um, you know human freedom is the reason, or there's all these other ones. There's actually like I, I, I'm aware of at least a half a do- uh, I'm sorry, at least a dozen or so reasons that theologians and philosophers say here's the reason why God allows evil. And so when we're responding to this kind of an argument, somebody wants to know what is the reason. So what you do is you reach into your theodicy bag and you pull out some reason. I would reach in and pull out the human freedom one. I say, here's the reason. This is why God allows pain and suffering. And here's how it goes. God wants, God values us as self-determiners of our action and our character. As self-determiners of our actions and character, we have significant or genuine freedom. But as creatures who are self-determiners of our character, sometimes we misuse that freedom. When we misuse that freedom, we bring about moral evil. Well, we bring about evil. That's the free will theodicy. So why does God allow evil? Because he values something else more. There's a greater good, namely our freedom. Because in that freedom, we can worship God freely and and we can have genuine relationships and things like that. Does that make sense? Okay, so here's what's happening then with the theodicy and the theodicy bag. We're responding to this claim that there's pointless evil. And we say, here's the reason Okay, so you kind of think of it like this. Here's, our, here's all the kinds of evil there is, let's say. Here's your moral evil. Here's your natural evil. Reach into our bag, and I pulled out the free will reason. Said, it's because God wants us to be free, and we misuse our freedom. Okay, and then you go and ask, does that account for all evil? And I think it does a pretty good job over here, right? We can kind of account for all of this. But does it account for this? Obviously. Now, so you got to kind of go back. You go back to your theodicy bag and you select another one. So I'd select the natural law one. Okay, let's try that. And here's the natural law theodicy. This is how the story goes. Um, In order to be genuinely free, the world needs to be orderly and predictable. If it wasn't orderly or predictable, when I willed to do something, I wouldn't know that what I'm willing to do would actually take place. So if I willed to hug my wife, but I ended up singing the Star Spangled Banner, that would be a really weird world, and I really wouldn't be free, right? You need to have regular laws of nature to have genuine freedom. Um, But the very same worlds that have regular laws of nature are the same worlds that have tornadoes and hurricanes and disease and and, and cause rocks to fall on my toe and break it and, and so on. And so that's why we have natural evils. It's part of a byproduct of a world in which we can function as free beings. Okay? So you take that, you look at that reason, you say, okay, cool. That covers, you know, that rock that fell on my toe, and you guys tell me when to stop. How much evil does that cover? Should I, should I go all the way, or if you kind of get what I'm doing, or no? No? So, you know, you, it, say, you, say it, it covers this. Well, okay, I need to go get another theodicy. So you reach in, and I'm not going to keep doing that, but you keep reaching in until you get enough reasons to try to cover every instance of evil. That's the strategy of the theodicy strategy. Would the supernatural be in that? What do you mean? The devil made me do it. The devil made me do it could, would be part of the... Well, um, you would have to explain that a little bit more. Um, and uh, it would be somewhere in there, because you're giving a reason, right? You're trying to explain a way why evil. Yeah, yeah, so you'd give your little more, you'd have to say a little bit more to give it a story, um, but that would be an example of giving a theodicy. Yeah. Yeah, yep. 
Yeah, so what you could do is you could recircle back and say, oh, whoa, 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 we stopped here on free will, but we haven't thought it through theologically, right? You could say, wait a minute, what about the fall? What accounts for the fall? And wh what actually happened in the fall? Well, there's, there's, you know, the idea that Paul seems to suggest in Romans 8 that it's not just a fall of man, but it's actually a cosmic fall, right? The whole, the whole all of creation is groaning. Um, and so maybe... And then maybe the free will stuff, actually, maybe I could have kept going. And so that's fine. We, just keep, we would just keep going that way. So I'm just kind of giving you how this typically works, yeah. It could be that one theodicy covers every instance of evil. Maybe the fall of, you know, the devil or something like that. Um, and sometimes people go that way. Sometimes in apologetics, that's not always the best way, way to go at the front end. But that could be at the end of the day, you know, the reason or something like that. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a huge question. Why, why um, if Adam and Eve were, per, were perfectly free in the garden and had everything they wanted, when did their desires bend such that they chose wrong? Like what caused that initial bending? And you know, there's, it's interesting in, in um, Genesis 3, you know, there's actually no mention of Satan if you go back there. We, we read Satan back into that, and I think rightly so, but it's just a serpent. And there's, so evil's already present, interestingly, by the time you get to Genesis 3. And so then we have to think, well, where did that come from? You know, and then we, you know, we, we go back to the fallen angels, and, and, and so there's a backstory. But I think even for um, Adam and Eve in the garden, there's this question, what was that initial bending when you had everything? You had shalom, the way it was supposed to be. Say what? How so? Okay. Well, yeah, that's true. So we had, we had the, the restriction there. Um, but that's okay, because nobody thinks we're ever perfectly free. Like, I'm not free to jump to the moon right now, but we still wouldn't say I'm not free in a significant sense. Yeah. Yeah, so what, what I think um, Adam and Eve had, though, that we share is morally significant freedom, right? Yeah, and that, that's all... That's all we usually mean by uh, this kind of freedom, something that's morally significant. But then you can't use that other corollary to make it work if, it, if they don't match up. That there's two kinds of freedom? No, I kind of got lost in there, but yeah. you, you bypassed it. Okay. Yeah, yeah maybe, maybe you could, I'd be curious what you're saying, uh, maybe after, so. Okay, cool. Um, so here's the thing. Let's, I'm going to try to show you. I, I actually don't think theodicies actually work uh, myself. Um, I think that we do have reasons that are clear in Scripture for why God allows evil. But I don't think that we have in all cases the answer for why God allows evil myself. Now, Christians disagree on this. People debate this all the time. They've been debating Augustine advanced this free will one, and Irenaeus advanced a, another one called the soul-making theodicy. So Christians have been debating this forever. But, but kind of where I sit, I, I read things like Isaiah 55, where it says things like, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Um, I read things like Job, the last section of Job there, um, where God basically asks a series of questions to Job um, with the implication, who are you to understand you know, the infinite mind. I read the, the end of the doxology in Romans 11 actually is really powerful here where this is the doxology where um, there's a phrase, I think it's verse uh, 33, where it says, your, your reasons, O God, are inscrutable to me. This is Paul speaking. And so I read passages like that and I think, well, I think we can identify reasons why God would allow, but not in all cases, Right? Does that make sense? At least that's kind of where I'm at. I know Christians will disagree. I actually tend to think the other response is, is the better response. 
So not the theodicy route, although I like this, I think we can learn things, but for the, for the, for the why does God allow evil, I think at the end of the day, we don't actually always know. And I, I actually think there's good reasons to think that we wouldn't know. And let me give you that argument so you don't think it's a cop-out. I've actually taught this in, like at Purdue when I was a grad student in philosophy. The atheist would jump on this one and say, of course we wouldn't know. And so there's actually an argument. So let me give you it because it's kind of interesting. It's actually called skeptical theism if you want to know. The second option here, uh, the one, let's see if we can get back. Option B there, there is a morally justified reason for evil, but we just don't know it in all cases. It's called skeptical theism, but we're not skeptical that God exists. We're just skeptical that we would know the reason in all cases for evil. So hopefully you hear that. That's what it's called in the literature. But, but here, here's why I think it's actually the right response. Um, think of it this way. Let me, let me get to my notes here. Um, okay, so the atheist says, hey, we're looking out at the world and it just... And so here's the example that's often thrown in the literature. It's actually about Bambi. It's kind of sad. Um, but it, there's, there's two, two instances that are always in the literature. One is about Bambi. You know, this deer that's, that's in, uh, in the woods, and um, the woods get struck by lightning, and a fire happens, and Bambi gets burned, and she suffers for a week, and then she dies. That's a pointless evil, says William Rowe, one of my professors, the, probably the most famous atheist of the last 50 years, who, who staked his whole career on the problem of evil. Um, he made a pretty powerful argument from the animal pain. Why do animals suffer? There's no purpose there. And then there's other examples on the human realm as well, where it just seems pointless. And the argument given by the atheist is basically this. See if you can hear the inference. Hey, we don't see the reason, so there probably isn't a reason. Okay, that's the basic inference pattern. We don't see the reason why God would allow evil, so there isn't one. It's called, it has a funny name, now, in the literature, it's called the no see em inference. We don't see them. There isn't one, you know? So, now the no see em inference actually isn't a bad inference in all cases. So, if I went to my house tonight and I opened up the fridge and I said, no see em, a gallon of milk, therefore there's no milk in this fridge. Is that a good inference? Yes, right? Why? Because... Gallons of milk are, you know, they're pretty big, and I would see that in my fridge. So, there, so in some cases, the no see inferences are good. I don't see a gallon of milk, therefore we don't ha- we're out of milk. But on the other hand, say I'm, like, say I'm sitting at my kitchen, I'm looking out into the, the yard, and 80 feet away I say, you know what, I don't see any slugs in the grass, therefore there are no slugs in the grass, no see Is that a good inference? 80 yards away, no slugs in the grass. No. Okay, so here's the question. What's the difference? Why is the first one a good inference, but the second one a bad inference? And if we can get that, you get the, the key to this whole thing. Um, we'll say, we can say a little bit more than that. Okay, good. Yeah, you're on the right track. Um, Right, for the gallon, but not the slug. Yeah, so my sensory apparatuses are such that I would expect to see a gallon of milk, but I'm not created in the, same, in the way that I would expect to see a slug 80 feet away, you know, in the grass. So, that's, so apply that to the question of evil. Are we the kinds of beings that would expect to see, in all cases, God's reasons for allowing evil? And I think that there's good reasons, if we put our, our theology caps on, there's good reasons to think that we're not in a position to know in all cases, unless, of course, God tells us the reason. Mainly, we're just limited. We are finite. We're limited in space and time. God is infinite. He knows the beginning from the end and everything in between, and he's ordered all of this world according to his purposes, right? So if you think about it, we're just not in a position. And this is the point where I can remember sitting in a class teaching on this topic, and the atheist in the front row, who was a really good student, actually, he defended this in front of the whole class. He's like, of course, if God doesn't exist, he wouldn't know the reason all the time, right? This is, this is not a cop-out. It's actually, there's good reason to think, given human limitations, that we wouldn't know. So I actually, I actually think this is right. Um, I don't know. And that's, but I know that God has a morally justified reason, right? And I have other reasons to know that God exists. 
and he's good, and so on. Does that make sense? Okay, everything I've said to this point is something that any mere theist could say. I, 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 and I've given this exact talk in secular settings tons of times. Here's the thing though, let's move from mere theism, so mere belief in a monotheistic God, to Christian theism. Because here I think we actually have God's answer to the problem of pain. And this is where I think the Christian answer is way superior than the generic answer, which I actually think is sufficient for the, the argument. But we want more than just an argument, right? We want to know, God, what's going on with evil? So here's, here's um, how I would push this, everything I said, just two steps further. And then, then I think we can wrap up and talk about what you guys want. First thing I want to say is that there's an intuition behind that question. Remember the question was, God, why do you allow pain and suffering? That's a great question. Behind that, there's an intuition, though. So think, think with me on this for a minute. When people ask that question, the intuition that drives that question is, Something's not right. Why, why is there all this pain and suffering, God? In other words, this isn't the way it is supposed to be, right? And that's, that's exactly right. Put our theology caps back on. That's exactly right. This world is turned upside down, right? We live in a fallen world. It's crooked. It's bent. Whatever, whatever word you want to use here, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, right? It's, this is a, a fallen world or a, a sin-violated world, shalom-violated world, and so things just don't go the way that they're supposed to be. Um, so that's the intuition that I think is really important to point out because it points to the fact that we all, all long for a world made right. And I think we even have a sense in our mind, if you pay attention, this is, um, this is actually an important point. If we pay attention to our longings, and I think we all long for the world made right, I think our longings actually tell us something that we've lost. Well, what have we lost? I think we've lost home. That is shalom, that is the Garden of Eden, that is the way the world is supposed to be. And so in some ways, this question only makes sense because as, um, well, his name's Pascal, but a philosopher would have put it, that we have a whiff of a memory of a time when man was truly happy, capital H, happy, like the classic sense. In other words, the Garden of Eden. Okay, so that's the first thing, there's this intuition. And secondly, when we, when we add our theology to this kind of philosophy, um, I think that God does have an answer to the problem of pain and suffering. But what's interesting is God's answer isn't a, a proposition. It's not a philosophical argument. It's something much deeper. It's actually a person. It's Christ on a cross. And if you think about it, isn't that the answer that will satisfy? Because the problem of evil or the question, why does God allow pain and suffering, isn't just a philosophical question. I mean, it is that, but it's more than that, right? It's something that we all live with at the level of our lives. And so I think ultimately the answer must be existential, right? It must be something that's at the level of our lives. It must be personal, not just propositional. So what's God's answer? It's Christ. It's Christ on a cross. What has God done on the, what has Jesus done on the cross? He's taken all of our sin, all of our pain, all of our suffering upon himself so that we can have you know, victory from the sting of sin and death and suffering and things like that. So that's the, that's the cool thing, uh, I guess, with Christianity, is that God's answer goes a little bit further um, than mere Christianity, okay? So big picture, um, we all want to be happy. We've misidentified happiness as something shallow, like sensual pleasure. Therefore, we've misidentified man's fundamental problem. It's not just pain. It is a problem, but that's not the deepest problem we have. And so we misidentify the, the solution. It's not technology, right? Our fundamental problem is actually sin. Our solution is, this, is a savior. And that's the same answer um, for the problem of evil. All right, so I, wanted to, I didn't want to go forever. I threw actually a whole lot there. What do you guys want to talk about, though? Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's like the problem in this world is pain. Right. And then it comes down to desire. So you try to rid yourself of all right. the desires and thoughts. And like, this is the answer that they need. This right. Is, you know, Christ himself took upon him mm -hmm. our pain and our suffering and our yeah. sorrow. And it's not the lack of desire. God created us to uh, you know, have the fulfillment of God's 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. It is, it is so interesting with Buddhism especially. Um, we extinguish our desire to get out of the cycle of pain and suffering. That's t- completely the wrong... And it's interesting, you know, so cla- I teach, um, right now I'm teaching, a, um, we have this great books program in the college, and I teach there as well as the seminary, and, and we're, right now I'm reading the ancient stuff. So we, uh, we're on Aristotle this week. We finished Plato's Republic uh, earlier, and, and now we're talking about the virtues. And um, I forgot exactly why I was sharing this. Uh, huh. Oh, desires. Yeah, Buddhism, desires, sorry. I lo- it was good. It was right here. It's really good. Um, It'll come back to me, I promise. But I totally lost it. But yeah, that, it, it is sad. Um, oh, this is it. So we're studying the virtues. And classically, there are four virtues. Courage, wisdom, temperance, and justice. And then the, the church added the three theological virtues to the four classic virtues, faith, hope, and love. And you have your seven cardinal virtues, then your corresponding seven cardinal sins. What's interesting, though, of those seven cardinal virtues, one of those we don't take to heaven. Hope. Hope is the one virtue that we won't need in heaven because all of our longings will be satisfied. So hope is the Christian virtue of um, one day everything will be made well once again. And, and happiness is actually union with God and everything that that entails. So the, yeah, that, it's just interesting that the ancients were plumbing the depths of reality and they were so close. They just didn't have you know, special revelation in Christ and all that. Um, but yeah, that's, anyway, that's, sorry. Side, sidebar, but yeah. There's the, uh, the possibility that uh, the, this whole question, it seems to me, opens the door for, um, for instance, if uh, we, we go with the premise that things are, are not the way they're supposed to be. Yeah. Well, how do we know that there's even another way? Mm-hmm. You know, and that, I think, argues for the existence of God. Totally. And yeah. Yeah. Possible for us. Totally. I think that opens the door. Yeah. And, and that's why I've started um, when I, uh, this is probably the question that I, got, I get asked to speak on the most when I travel around the country, is this question. And I, I used to just kind of give your standard philosophical, you know, there's kind of a, you know, you just give your thing. But I've started to begin with, um, let's, let's talk about this intuition behind the question. Because I think what we, the intuition reveals when we have this intuition that things aren't the way they're supposed to be, it, it, the flip side of that intuition is that we long for a, way, a, a world that is the way it's supposed to be. And the way that I use that, the way that I've begun to explain that is that we long for home. And I think the word home, uh, home is the closest metaphor we have for life, right? We all live in a home. And, and then not only that, we leave our home only to return at the end of the day. So the rhythm of our life is really home away and then home again. And oddly, I think that's actually the, that's the storyline of Scripture. God creates a place and, and, and then a people and gives us a purpose, Genesis 1 and 2, home. And then Genesis 3, we're away. And really from Genesis 3 to the end, it's, it's God wooing us back through our longing for home again. And so really the, the rhythm of our lives is the, the story of, of the Bible, home, away, and home again. And so I think that this intuition is um, it's telling no, we long for a world made right. Anyway, yeah, it's good. Good word. If, uh, I don't even know how to ask this, but have you ever heard of uh, talking about pain and suffering, that if there were never a crooked line, that we wouldn't have yeah. a straight line? Yeah. Does that make sense? It does. Yeah, I think that that's right. That's, um, there, that's, there's a whole family of arguments, and that's one argument that goes like this. It says, you say, atheist, that there's evil. But you, what you, and in fact, when I said, when you asked what is evil, um, I said it's an ought not to be. Well, that was actually Richard Gale, who's an atheist philosopher, who gave that definition. So how does an atheist philosopher talk about oughtness? Because there is no oughtness if all there is is matter in this world. And so the argument is, you say there's objective evil, but you can't have objective evil if there's no objective standard of right and wrong. And you can't have an objective standard if there's no God. And so in, in complaining about evil, you, you know, you're actually supporting the existence of a God. And so I th- is that what you're thinking? Th- that is out there, and I think that's right. I think we're right to push that. When Richard Dawkins says, 
um, in his book, The Blind Watchmaker, he has this line where he basically says, there is no good, there is no evil. And then he says in his next book that God is a moral monster. I think we're right to, to challenge him in his inconsistency there. Wait a minute, there is no good and evil, but God is a moral monster. What do you mean by moral monster? How can there be a moral monster if there's no good or evil, you know? So it's good. Okay, anything else? Got a, I think just a couple of minutes. serpent? Um, you mean the one the, in Genesis 3 serpent? Uh, I, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> These are the great questions. Um, I'm, I mean, I think it's, it's personification, a kind of personification of the devil, the Satan. Um, but uh, so it would be a created entity. It would be a created being created by God that went wrong, you know, that's, that's, yeah, that's all I guess all I would say. It's a great question. All right. When I pray for you, um, I love that you guys are doing this. I, I, you know, I'm sorry if I just kind of, there's so much out there. But, I, you know, I want you to know, even if you don't take everything from what I said, I want you to know there are, there are good replies. And actually, let me just leave you with this. If you, if you want some extra resources, this, the top one here, Peter Crave, Making Sense of Suffering, I give it out to non-believers all the time. It's really a creative way to engage the topic. Um, he, he looks at what artists have to say and philosophers and theologians and historians and sociologists and, and he kind of takes us through this journey that leads to Christ on a cross is God's answer. C.S. Lewis, classic, Problem of Pain. Um, this one, only for the faint at heart or the not faint at heart. Um, that's really technical philosophy. But the first two, I'd recommend as good kind of entry level stuff for this. All right, let me pray for you, and then we'll let you get to your night. Lord, I thank you for, um, yeah, we know that these, these questions are, I, I could never do justice to it in 45 minutes, but Lord, we ultimately know that um, you are good and that you exist, and yet there is pain and suffering. And Lord, um, I, we also know that that's not the deepest problem in our lives, although it is bad. Um, but that the deepest problem is sin and you've taken not only our sin, but all our pain and suffering that one day will be made, will be made whole. And so I thank you for that promise. Thank you that we do have hope and that we can live our life um, hopefully and that we can point, to other, to point others to you as the only hope for uh, this, this sting of, of pain. And so we thank you that you are faithful and loving and care for us. And I pray that everybody here would... would um, just um, have a sense of your deep love for them. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.